Sunday. Good morning. A little bit. Thank you. That's much better. Good morning. Welcome to chapel. Um, this morning, before I introduce today's speaker, who's actually going to be with us on Monday and on Wednesday, um, but before I do, I want to mention that two weeks from today, we will be having Academic Chapel, which is a partnership with the Provost's Office and the various colleges here at the university. And you will be going to uh, chapel gathering with your dean and with your faculty according to the school that your major is housed in. And um, so um, there was a slide up earlier. Um, we're still evolving on a couple of those locations. And so we'll, we'll update you via email and some other ways to let you know the specifics. But that is two weeks from today. Um, I am excited about today's speaker. This is part of our Staley Lecture Series that we do every year um, to bring a speaker on campus to specifically talk about our spiritual lives and how to nurture our spiritual lives. And usually they're here for, um, for two sessions, and so today's speaker will be here um, today and also on Wednesday. He is the pastor of Quest Church in Seattle, Washington. He's also... Um, the author of Overrated, and he is um, the founder of One Day's Wages, which I'm sure he'll be sharing about. And actually today, the Center for Vocational Ministry here at APU is hosting a Q&A with him immediately after this morning's chapel in Adams, um, Adams Lobby area, and I would invite you to come and to hear, but would you please welcome with me Pastor Eugene Cho. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Yes, I know it's a Monday morning. Good morning, everyone. Yes. It is a joy to uh, be here. I was here last year, and it was an amazing, amazing experience. I came here with my daughter last year, who is a senior in high school. Uh, she's applying to APU, got in. She's praying. Uh, we'll see how the Lord directs her. Uh, but this year, I have another guest with me, and if I could take a couple minutes to introduce her. My, my wife is here with me. Uh, honey, can you just stand up really quickly? All right, that's my wife right there. Okay. If you see her on campus today, would you just be kind enough and ask her what, what year she is at APU? Uh, that would cheer her up immensely. Uh, I mentioned this last year. My wife happens to be a, a marriage therapist. Anyone here interested in studying counseling or therapy by any chance? A couple of you guys here. So my, my wife is a, a family and marriage therapist. Uh, pause for dramatic effect. Uh, that basically means that she wins every argument in our home. <laughs> She's like a Jedi Knight when it comes to marriage stuff. And... Uh, Therapists, counselors, they have this huge, big blue book, and it's called DSM. It's a diagnosis book, right? And so when we get into a discussion, a.k.a. argument, it's amazing. Like a ninja, she'll grab that book, and I won't even know, and she'll grab that book, and then she'll say, stop, hold on for a second. <laughs> and she'll say, uh, Eugene, um, you're wrong. And she wins again. It's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> so I have two sessions with you, and I'm very excited. But let me just warn you ahead of time. Uh, if you're able to, and again, not out of obligation, I'm not going to be able to get through my sermon in one session. So part one is today. If, you're, if there's any way that you can come back for Wednesday... Because uh, I want to share with you seven helpful, practical things about spirituality for you. That's my invitation, is to speak to you about spirituality. And I'm not going to be able to introduce our text, to do it justice, and then to be able to share with you seven practical things. I'm hoping to share three today and four next week. So if you're able to, join me next week. So if you have your Bibles with you. If you have your uh, apps with you, I think it's okay for you to turn that on. It's Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 27. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 27. Listen for the word of God. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? 
Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Pray with me. Lord, thank you again so much for the gift, the privilege of coming together. Oh, Holy Spirit, we ask for your presence here. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. And all God's children said, amen. Some of you might be wondering why this passage, as we're speaking about as part of this lecture series on spirituality, why this passage? Because I suspect that some of you, maybe even most of you, might be thinking, wait a minute, I don't resonate with this character in this passage. We have someone in this Bible passage in Luke 18 that is identified. While we don't know much about him, we do know three things about this person. This character is defined by many biblical scholars, pastors, Christians as rich, young ruler. So right off the bat, aside from the word young, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't resonate with this, so what does this person have to do with my spirituality in this season of my life? And what I'd like to begin in setting the foundation for the next 20 minutes along with Wednesday is actually make the case that you have a lot to do with this person more than you can imagine. A lot of us living in the Western culture of materialism, where the voice of materialism is one dominant voice, and that is this, you don't have enough. It's the pervasive message all around us. You don't have enough. Every commercial on some way or another, if you take Marketing 101, it tells you that every human being have Five very strong dominant needs in our life or fears. It speaks to fear and success and popularity and appearance and wealth. These are the five big pillars that people identify as needs in our soul. So what media, what materialism, what a dominant culture tells you is they try to pick on those five very things to somehow tell you, you just don't have enough. This is the reason why in our larger culture, we might not be smart enough, tall enough, thin enough, wealthy enough, whatever the blank enough might be, and it is why the gospel of Christ is so powerful. It sees us, meets us, knows us, loves us, and says that Jesus is enough for us in our lives. Now, some of you are thinking, well, because I'm a college student, I don't have money, I have loans, I have whatever it might be, you might be thinking, I don't resonate, but I want you to know this morning that if you're a student at Azusa Pacific University, you are among the 6% of this world that gets to go to college. In other words, you are rich. You are privileged. You're more of this rich young ruler than you can possibly imagine. 
If you own a computer, if you have access to a computer among the labs at the school, you are among the 22% of the world's population that has access to a computer. Now, I say this not to make you feel guilty by any means, but I want you to know why, as I've been praying for this week, why I felt this impression to share the story of the rich young ruler with you. Now, I know that in a room like this, in a student body as large as Azusa Pacific, there isn't one single monolithic group or thought. You come with uniqueness and stories and backgrounds and ethnicities and languages and culture. But I also want you to realize that you are more of this rich young ruler than you possibly can imagine. Full disclosure, as a pastor in Seattle... My salary as a pastor is $68,000 a year. Full disclosure, that's what I make. I don't know if that's a lot or a little in your world, but $68,000, if I can be very honest, and I know as a pastor I shouldn't say this, but yes, there's a voice that says, I want more. I deserve more. I work hard. I've got kids going to college, but did you know that with my salary at $68,000 a year, it puts me among the world's wealthiest people? Now, I know some of you know the world's wealthiest people. Bill Gates, uh, I call him Billy. Billy, my good friend. No, I don't know him. He doesn't return my tax. But Billy Gates is the wealthiest person in the world. Warren Buffett is, I think, number two or three, and they have a specific rank. Magazines publish the rank of the wealthiest people. I want you to know that I am among the world's wealthiest people. My rank, if you're curious, I am the 52nd million, 40,000, 162nd richest person in the world you better respect. Now, you're like mocking me. Oh, how nice. (laughs) Now, it doesn't sound very impressive to say I'm in the 52nd millionth rank. But if I were to put that in percentile, it puts me in the top 0.86 percentile of wealth in the world. I'm in the top 1%. This is you. This is, in a sense, probably what you're studying for, working for. We might not talk about it, but success and security are many of the things that we desire in our world and culture. And I'm not suggesting that it's a bad thing. I just want you to know, as we're talking about spirituality that is meaningful and substantive and rooted in Scripture, that's God-honoring and Christ-centered and Holy Spirit-sustained, that you have to realize that this passage is not about that person. It's not about Bill Gates. It's not about Warren Buffett. It's not about the person that lives in Calabasas. It's about you. So my prayer is the Holy Spirit convicts us. Here's another reason before we get into the story why this is so important. When I speak with young people, we have a lot of young folks at our church. One of the most common things that I hear from people is, well, if only I see Jesus, if I had an encounter with Jesus, if I actually met Jesus, If I actually spoke with Jesus, if I had a true, real encounter with Jesus, my life would be so different. And you know what I would say to that? I would say, I think you're wrong. I think we're overestimating or we're underestimating the power of idolatry, the power of apathy, the power of sin that can somehow take us away uh, in a true spirituality with Jesus. And the reason why I say that is that in our scripture today, we see a young person just like yourself who meets Jesus, has a conversation with Jesus, asks a question that's meaningful to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And if you're a religious person, that's an important question, and Jesus answers the question. 
Jesus summarizes the second portion of the Ten Commandments that relates to other people. But Jesus doesn't just give pat religious answers. He doesn't just quote scripture. Jesus, who knows all things, probes into the heart and the soul of this young rich ruler and realizes that he's in bondage. He's enslaved and says, young man, go sell everything that you have and follow me. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is the invitation for every single person, but I do believe that what the Holy Spirit desires for us in our spirituality is that if there are things in your life that is holding you bondage, that is enslaving you, the will of God, the heart of God, the desire of God is that you and I would repent, let go of these things and follow Jesus. That's an honest spirituality. It's amazing, and this might sound heretical, But if we're talking about sharing good news, sharing the gospel, about evangelizing, Jesus actually fails. This young, rich ruler doesn't convert, doesn't say yes. Now clearly Jesus didn't fail, but for me, the reason why this is so powerful is because it reminds me of the power of idolatry and sin in our life. And when we're speaking about spirituality, that's not meant to be a nebulous word. It's meant to be something that we believe in, that's informed by Scripture, guided by the Spirit, guided by the life of Jesus, and we're living it out every single day, knowing that it's not perfect, but we live it out. So then, what does spirituality look like? Now, you have a great team of chaplains and pastors and mentors here, and I believe there's a lot of things that we can share here. But for the sake of time, I want to share with you seven things. Seven's a biblical number, so seven things that I want to share with you over the course of the next two days. The first thing about what it means to live a spirituality for our time, for rich young rulers like yourself, here's the first one. It's probably the most important one. It's one that I want to be preaching again and again and again. It's something that I hope you hear thousands of times in your lives. I hope it's something that you sing over your life, that you sing and you speak over the lives of others, believers and non-believers. The most important thing, number one, that I want to share with you about spirituality is this truth. Listen, God loves you. God loves you. Now, I know what you're thinking. I've heard this. It's the most profound, important truth. But in some ways, that's the challenge because we hear it so often, we forget the absolute scandalous, profound, amazing nature of God's love and grace. And the reason why I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God loves you, this is my proof, in the next two minutes, I believe God loves you because he knows everything about you. Now, I don't know if that makes sense. Let me break it down. That's scary. Do you know you and I, we regularly wrestle with authenticity in our life? We regularly wear masks in our life. We hide behind our clothes, our, our, our stuff, our possessions, our status, our degrees. We're all insecure people. We hide certain things. When you look at our social media, and I use social media, but you understand we write things that give a certain impression of us. In other words, we share that which how we want people to perceive us. This is the reason why nobody shares a photo of themselves on Instagram right when you've waken up in the morning because you look nasty. (laughs) 
as do I. All of our Instagram photos are the best filtered parts of our lives. Look at my new shoes. Look at my dress. Look at my suit. Look at my muscles. Look at the food that I'm about to have in this angle and that angle and this angle. Dude, just eat your food. (laughs) But when I say God loves you, I'm saying God knows everything about you. And how do we know God loves you? He's still here. He's still chasing after you. He's still pursuing after you. That's profound. My wife and I were celebrating our 19th anniversary this week. It's one of the reasons why she's here. Now, you don't know this, but if I can just share a little story. Minhi and I, we met about 20 plus years ago. We met while I was a pastor in Korea. I had the guts to finally ask her out during the last week I was in Korea. We had five very intense dates before we were in a long distance relationship. To give you some perspective, email just started coming in during that time. They called it at that time, it wasn't even called email, it was called, listen to this, electronic mail. Now, when we had our first date, it was nice and pleasant. We went to a restaurant in a neighborhood in Seoul, Korea. It was a nice, cute Korean drama. And we're, we're eating together and had a nice conversation for some of you who watch Korean drama. And, and during dessert, she asks what I consider to be the most terrifying question a man can receive. She was sitting across the dining table. Clearly, she was smitten by me. She was like this. She was like this. And then she says to me, she goes, Eugene, tell me everything about your life. Now, listen, the reason why this is scary is because in a momentary second, Millions of synapses crossed my mind. I don't even know what that means, but millions, <laughs> millions of synapses crossed my mind, and I wrestled with the question, do I tell her everything, or do I tell her the Christian version? You know the Christian version, right? You smile, kind of look off to the side. Um, I I once was lost, (laughs) but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Now, this is the truth. I wrestled with this because in that moment, I said to myself, if this woman knew everything about my life, how could she possibly be interested in a second date? How do we know God loves you? He knows everything. The stuff that you've hid in the crevices of your soul. Every dark thought that you've had in your mind. God knows everything. And he's still here. Oh, it's profound Scandalous love. I'm going to just share point one, and then we'll get to the six on Wednesday. (laughs) Because it's that important. It's something that I pray will never grow stale in your life. When I say Jesus loves you, that God loves you, it means that while you might recall your salvation story, I came to faith personal. I grew up in a family that had an idea of Jesus. My great-grandfather, my great-grandfather was one of the first people to say yes to Jesus in a small city outside of a larger city called Pyongyang in a country that is now called North Korea. And as a result, 
the whole household, my great-grandmother came to faith. It was at the age of 18 years old when it made so much more personal sense to me. I was working in my mother's deli shop when a Hispanic custodian at this IBM building where my mother had a small little deli every single day for three months over that summer while I helped out at my mom's shop. This Hispanic custodian by the name of Raimondo Gonzalez. I feel like I studied and labored through four years of Spanish to hear the gospel from Raimondo. And Raimondo would come to me and says, Eugenio, tu necesitas Jesús Cristo en tu corazón. You need Christ in your heart. Quieres aceptar Jesús Cristo. And every day I would say, no, 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 no. And in the corner of my room in that summer of 1989, I said, yes to Jesus. Now, I remember that time with joyfulness and gratitude, but when I say God loves you, it's not a romantic, glamorized perspective of the past when you accepted Jesus in middle school camp or when you were baptized 17 years ago or when you were born as a Christian in your mother's womb. It means every single day we want to invite you, say yes to Jesus every day. And you know what honest spirituality is? It means some days we say no. If we're bluntly honest, I'm not saying that your salvation is in doubt. I'm saying that every single day what it means to have an honest spirituality with thousands of voices approaching you, trying to inform your thoughts, your hearts, is to say, yes, Jesus, today, again, I believe in the resurrection. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you arose again. I believe that you will come back. I believe that you love me. I believe that you have a purpose for my life, and I want to live in obedience, surrendering my heart to you. Oh, Holy Spirit, guide me. That's what it means when we say God loves you, that you understand that God loves you, but you also understand, here it is, from the depths where the mercy and grace of God saves us from. A dangerous aspect in today's modern spirituality is that many of us, we think we actually deserve God's grace. The Bible makes it clear we deserve death, and condemnation, and that's why grace is irrational and scandalous. I know some of you, many of you, have heard of this word called grace. The love of God is the grace of God shown to us, but because we hear certain words so often, we don't quite understand how it meets us in our daily spirituality. Grace is when you receive something so magnificent, so magnanimous, and yet you have no entitlement to that very thing. That's why it is radically crazy, scandalous. Uh, Let me tell you a story. Many of you probably drive. I've driven, and if I can be honest with you, on occasion, if I'm very lazy, I could have a heavy foot. I could speed sometimes. So I've been caught for speeding twice in my life. I've been stopped several more times, okay? Just to be very honest with you, don't judge me, you judger. (laughs) You can judge me, it's okay. So what happens is that when I get caught for speeding, the policeman pulls me over and says, young man, I feel really good, young man, do you know how fast you were going? And I go, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure. Goes, you were going 80 miles per hour in a 60 mile per hour zone. That's like LA every single day. But <laughs> I'm going 80 miles per hour, and the cop says he goes to his car to write me a ticket. Now, I should receive a ticket because I broke the law. You know what that's called? That's called justice. That's justice. What if. He pulls me over and he says, you know what, young man, um, it's Asian American month and um, um, I'm going to let you go. That's never happened. (laughs) But just once I want it to happen. (laughs) Now what is that? 
A lot of people think that's grace. That's just mercy. You know what grace is? It's the cop that says, um, I'm going to pay this ticket for you. And then I'm going to give you everything that I have. It's crazy. It's irrational. This is the grace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll see you Wednesday. God, thank you again so much for the opportunity to be together today. Bless my sisters and brothers and all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys.